just how duplicitous maybe the British political elite were and, and in particular the Labour Party were. And then you you suddenly find yourself in a mosque waking up going, oh my God, God is Allah. What do you do with that? How do you understand this indefensible support for Israel in the West? You have young men saying, I get to dominate you. I mean, it's really, it's like seven-year-olds. So you live in Istanbul and anecdotally, it mm. seems to me that more and more Muslims have decided to leave the West mm. and to move to Muslim countries like Qatar or to Kuwait or to Istanbul. I think in Istanbul, we've seen, you know, a probably, I, I mean, last time I was there, I saw a, a growth in a number of Westerners, Western Muslims who've decided to to live there. And, and most of them say they they just had enough of the... Uh, the criticisms they get in the West, uh, they've had enough of the racism maybe they get or the Islamophobia, but also they fear for their kids. Mm. Um, it's now common for Muslims here to think about, if not moving to a different country, to think about pulling their kids uh, out of school. I mean, where do you stand on this discussion about how intense it's become in education and just general society towards Muslims? You know what, it's really interesting. For 10, 10 years, a friend of mine called Anissa, mm. she's an educator, mashallah. She has been raising the alert going, you don't know what's in the books. Really? She's been on these education groups that I'm on. She's like, mums, wake up. Ask to see the books on your kids' curriculum. What age? Not 11, not 10, 7 and 8. Mm. Ask to see them. Mm. And when you ask to see them, the teachers say, you don't need to. Or now, increasingly, you can't see them mm. in case you, you protest. Um, because it is such disgusting content in children's books at schools that they cannot show it on the news. The same nightly news that shows dead bodies and bombs falling and explosions and horrendous things going on cannot show the books that are being given to our four and five year olds. This, interestingly, this is a sign of a failing society. There was a study done in 1936 by a, a, a British academic, and he found the same trigger points for each failed civilization that he studied. Really? Yes, rise in androgyny, uh, liber not liberation of women, mm, I forget the word, but it's basically uh, no protection of the women, right? And um, the, the sexualization of society, a rise in homosexuality, all of these things are happening. It's a dire situation. And I totally understand Muslim families wanting to leave. It is. I, I, I thought about 10 years ago, actually, brother, that, and I still do, that if you really wanted to get the Muslims out of Europe yeah. and you couldn't kill them like the French did with the Algerians just 30 years ago and then threw their bodies or 40 years ago, threw them in the Seine, A'udhu Billah, um, that what you do is you just make it a little bit unlivable. Mm. A little bit unlivable. Let's say in France, you can't have halal meat at school. Why is that? No halal meat. You have to eat pork if you're at school mm. or go without. What if we, oh, I know, they don't like sex with outside marriage, the Muslims. Mm. How about we talk about that all the time? And how about we force, we, we say to their children, homosexuality is an option and we... We do that at a young age. That That is kind of social engineering. Now, I'm not saying this only affects the Muslim community. We're not paranoid. Mm. This is a devaluation of the human spirit across the spectrum. But it really is helping us leave. And I think it's a good leave. I think it's a good a good thing. Really? We should, yeah, I think we should, we should leave the sinking ship. And we should be building up our countries and uh, offering an alternative, which is what the Ottoman... Um, and the Al-Andalusian societies did was say, hey, come over here. We've got beauty here. We've got fairness here. We've got a way that you can move up the ranks in society. You're not trapped. And for that reason, hundreds of thousands, millions perhaps of uh, Christians came and lived in our Muslim communities. And the Jewish community thrived for centuries there. Um, I'm, I used to be an educator and I know that 20 years of the war on terror has in a way radicalize the teaching profession and today you've got teachers who see it as their duty to proselytize to convert muslim kids into good liberals or yeah. you know or something like that um you know 
this type of fear, I think, that Muslims face in, in this society is very palpable. Now, not everyone's going to be able to leave the country. You know, uh, we've got, what, two, three million Muslims in Britain. How, it's not going to be possible for yeah. those six million Muslims in France. Economic situation for majority of those Muslims in France would not enable them, allow them really to leave, even if they wanted to leave because of just the sheer amount of money that's required to move to somewhere like Turkey. Mm. You need to have some, some, you know, some, some capital behind you, I suppose. So, you know, in or the a job, you know, or to a be job, fair. or a job, right? So, in the absence of of that, um, how does a Muslim in this country still make it uh, in these societies? It's really tough. <laughs> it, there's no quick fix, is there? Yeah. I mean, you you live between here and and Istanbul too, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I I I left. But people do have to be here and they have elders and the people, the families I know who don't want to move, usually don't want to move because they ha they want to look after their parents and grandparents, mm. which is a beautiful duty. Yeah, yeah. And also these are our roots. This is our home. These yeah. are our, our villages, towns and cities. Where do we go and start again? It's pretty scary. I don't think there's a quick fix to this, I, but I do think that we need to improve our Muslim schools. I think if we do a good enough job that that the non-Muslims with an ounce of ethical grounding will actually want to come and be in our schools. Mm. Um, I don't know if I don't know enough about the education here to say, can you fight? Um, can you argue with the Department of Education about what children see now? Um, and, and they're coming for homeschooling as well. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. Um, can I turn to a, a broader question about how you perceive gender relations in Islam? There's a there's a raging debate, and again, it's usually online about whether what is the role of the men and women in the family. Mm. What's the role of men and women mm. in society? And of course, there are some who have a very liberal interpretation, and some who have an interpretation which makes it impossible for those families to function. But I'm I'm just talking about. I want to know about you know the the average, how do uh, normal Muslims view this? Um, let's let's first consider the idea of patriarchy, which is, of course, a, a buzzword uh, in the West. Can we describe the Islamic faith to be a patriarchal faith because of the way uh, Islam views the father as the as the uh, authority figure in the family and the responsible person and the person who has to provide? you know, for the maintenance of the entire household. Uh, that, for me, sounds like a very patriarchal uh, uh, idea. But, you know, the, the, the connotations attached to patriarchy, of course, are, are very negative. So how would you navigate that term, patriarchy? I think our, our idea of patriarchy really um, culturally goes back to the Victorians mm. because they're, they're, they're the man in certainly middle class and upper class society had absolute dominion over the women right property right property everything. inheritance right. you married you went from your father's house to your husband's house and you could carry none of that wealth with wow. you yeah right and if you if you if your father died and you inherited a great amount of land it was your husband's and he could do with it what you what what he liked spend right. it drink it give it give it away yeah and so that is a terrifying prospect and i think really as Westerners, as Europeans, we, as British people, we're traumatized by that. The women, we're traumatized by this legacy. We're traumatized by the fact that there, there was no protection from the heavy drinking, from the beatings, um, that, that we couldn't escape because we had no money. And this is not the Islamic, this is not the Muslim experience. Mm. Look at Khadija radiallahu anh, she had inherited wealth from uh, husbands, she had built an empire that she could keep after marriage. Mm. We have always had this. Um, and yet we're supposed to look at Islam through the lens of Victorian patriarchy and superimpose then hyper -femin fe fem um, feminism on top of it. Reject all of that. Mm. We don't want anything so to do with that. We start again. We, we start with a blank again. sheet. So yeah. then. Yeah, and also where where, where is the pa does Allah Taala say this is a patriarchal 
religion, women are lesser. No, these mm. interpretations were, were, were never what was understood. Right. You know, the, ma the woman is a cover for the man. The man is a cover for the woman. Yeah. The man has uh, one, one over on the woman. But what does that mean? What does it mean? He's got um, duties that are really, really heavy and beautiful. Mm. And actually, you know, me and my husband speak about this a lot because mm. uh, he's, 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 he's studied, alhamdulillah, he's got ijazah Marshall. in, in fic. And yes. it's, it's a man thrives with the weight of caring for people. Mm. And a woman thrives with that care being lifted and being looked after. No point is one pressure, pressuring or destroying or saying to the other change, right. but growing together and thriving. Yeah. You know, I, I want to say to my young sisters, you're talking to someone who for 30 years as an adult lived the ultimate in feminism. Mm. I've worked, I worked since I was 16. I was hugely successful at the age of 30. I earned more than my husband. Um, no one could tell me what to do. I was entirely liberated from any man. Mm -hmm. And what did that look like? Well, I'm telling you, you have your time of the month, you're tired. There's nobody showing you sympathy because, hey, I don't need your sympathy. I've, if you said I don't need your sympathy a hundred times, don't expect on day 101 mm. to go, I'm in pain. Well, you said you didn't need sympathy, mm. right? I, did, I carried my own bags. When I was pregnant, no man was carrying my bags. I had a I had some really horrible experiences during pregnancy. I remember once, um, and I hope you keep this in because it's really telling about, about vulner vulnerable moments that women have, okay? Because we need to accept our vulnerability. I was eight months pregnant. I was showing off how, how I could carry my eight months pregnancy and still be at the Labour Party conference. And it was one o'clock in the morning because I wasn't gonna go home early just because I'm pregnant. And I started to have really bad pains. I mean, like stabbing pains. And so I was sitting on a Brighton pavement in the rain at one in the morning, waiting for a taxi. And the taxi came and two young men from Blair's government, by the way, jumped in, jumped into the taxi. And I went, wait, I'm waiting as well. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And, and I said, but can't you let me go in? And then one of them said, he was 20 years old, why? I said, because I'm pregnant. He said, well, it's not my baby, is it? Is that really the society that we want? Is that really the liberty and egalitarian equality that we're fighting for? Don't be fooled. Um, I want to give another example because, because this, this, this made me laugh. I was on an underground train a couple of years ago, and I saw a young black sister and she was looking like she was absolutely going to faint. I don't know whether she was ill or just ha had been, been working hard. And she was exhausted standing up. And next to me was a young man and he looked Asian. I just love being an auntie. That's something else, by the way. <laughs> you know, Islam gives you a status to grow into. Yes. I can be as an ignore annoying and bossy and people are like, oh, it's auntie. Leave auntie alone. It's wonderful. You know, you have that space. Anyway, yes. the young man next to me, young Asian guy. And I said, excuse me, brother, are you Muslim? He said, yes, I am. I said, then get out of that chair and let the Muslim sister sit down. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, okay, auntie. Do you know what she did? Right. No, I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> I said, you're going to sit down and you're about to have a three-stop lecture from me about how to enable men to look after you. <laughs> yeah, because we're not enabling our men any longer to be the carers. And, and that makes them bitter and frigid. I'm more likely to say, I don't want to care for you. You don't deserve it. You're this, you're that. Leads leading to these these schisms yeah. and illnesses. And and I just wanted to end on that point of the patriarchy. Islam, Allah Ta'ala sees believers yes. and cares about piety. That's very clear from all of the texts. There isn't a male-female divide. Um, you know, it's not men in this line. Oh yeah, you get fast track to Jannah. Show me that tract. Mm -hmm. Show me where it says that doesn't alhamdulillah you know the patient ones the sabarine the kind ones the good ones the ones who give charity the ones who pray to their lord the ones that that's that's our parameters not the patriarchy there's a interesting point you made there about the friction that exists in wider society and the spillover into the muslim community i've noticed and again this may be uh, and we don't have to talk about him in particular but the andrew tate effect where there is this 
extreme response to hyperfeminism, and the response is this machoism, where with it comes this attitude that all women are bad. I mean, I think it's it's maybe a response, may not be a response, but there is a, an associated um, uh, feeling amongst women that all men are bad, all men are evil, mm. and that doesn't lead to very good relations between men and women. Um, we've noticed, and again, you know, you've been out of the country from. For, for a while, but we've noticed in this last year or two that the Andrew Tate type of ideas have started to develop currency amongst young men and young Muslim men. And some of it may be, may be positive, you know, giving them, you know, but a lot of it actually is a, an un-Islamic uh, way of viewing women. I mean, how have you come across this? And, and, and it's a confusing world for young men as well as young women, I suspect. Listen, I, you know, be right on the cutting edge of it with a daughter at university. You have young men saying, I get to dominate you. I mean, it's really, it's like seven-year-olds going, eh, I don't like boys, eh, I don't like girls. Yeah. You know, I don't like you because I, uh, you're less than me and I don't like you because you smell. It's pathetic and it really is damaging uh, the, the relations between the genders um, for our young Muslims, subhanAllah. You know, you've got, you've got an environment where a young man can and I've heard this twice recently, in two potential marriages, there were two engagements, and uh, both times the young men said, I have the right to check your emails and your phone. Wow, really? Yeah. And the family of the young women went hell to the no, mm -hmm. because, because that is psychologically controlling behavior. Yes. And it's unhealthy. But these sort of you know, noises off, if you like, these surround sound, um, I'm not going to even name them. Mm. The, these these people on social media, these men on social media who have their own toxic problems and their own, you know, lack of spirituality. It's a lack of spirituality from the brothers to 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 look at themselves and to say, "Am I? Be, how am I being beautiful? How am I being kind? How am I going to bring kindness into this?" Chivalrous. That's leadership. Yeah. That is leadership. Yeah. Being chivalrous is leadership. And on the other side, yes, we have a fractured and um, um, and um, what's it when it's um, it's not frigid, it's um, easily breakable version of a female femininity where they're afraid of the men, mm. and then that makes us more likely to run to the safety of the office, the safety of having our own money, mm. the safety of a life without a family, because I'm afraid of you. And we all need to get breach that gap. We we all all of us, uh, you know, the the learned people, the ones who are who are uh, you know role models or speakers, however you want to to call our, us elders. We need to to bridge that gap and say, come on, guys, speak to each other. Let's because I think it's hyper hyper individualism. Right, is is an issue here. Right, so to explain that hyper individualism. It's that yeah. it's about my rights uh, and about my response, my obligation, and that's it. That's all that counts. Yeah, you've. I mean, you know, I mean, we think so. A lot of the brothers, the young brothers, are saying feminism, and everything that a woman wants is now feminism. Mm. She's the kind of woman who wants two dresses, not one. Feminist. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. She's the kind of woman who would like to have her own keys to the door, feminine. No, what? Everything is called feminist now. Yes. And it's such a, a derogatory term. That's true. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. It's just bandied about yeah. for normative behaviours. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's interesting. And I, I suspect there needs to be more effort, probably from uh, Islamic scholars or Muslim role models, to to address this subject in a more... Uh, rational way, in a more sensible way, probably. Sure. Um, I know Imam Dawood Walid has written a book on Islamic chivalry, Muslim chivalry, nice. and he gives classes mm. to young men as to mm. how they should, you know, how they should respond to women and what should be their response. And brittle was the word, word brittle, I was thinking right. of. To, to my young sisters, I'd say, don't be brittle. Mm. Okay? If, if a young man says, can I take your chair, say, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you cared for. It makes you a part of that society. I'm a big one for going to events. And at the end, the sisters always want to gather the chairs. I'm like, no, you don't move anything. Brothers, 
Get in there. You, let's use those muscles that you're buffing up at the gym. Yes. Come and do something useful. You know, we need to give each other spaces. And um, when I said hyper-individualism, what did I mean? I meant, there's a, there, like you said, there's a selfishness. Mm. If you are a young sister and you want to go into marriage and you're like, but I'm not going to cook and I ain't going to do this. And well, what is the point of marriage? You just mm. want a flat chair, basically, <laughs> with somebody paying your bills. Yeah. No one's going to buy into that. It's not fair and it's not nice. Yeah. It's not kind. Just be kind to each other. Why can't people just be normal? Can I can I ask you a a, a couple of political questions? I know a lot of your your book uh, does discuss um, your politics prior to becoming Muslim and how you you changed um, not only socially and changed in, in terms of your spiritual attitude, but also your political understanding. And um, the Iraq War uh, is is I think a a, a key milestone in your political journey and just how duplicitous maybe the British political elite were and, and in particular the Labour Party were in taking Britain to war. I mean, again, you're from, a, from someone who now lives a lot of the year outside of the country. Has any of that improved? Do you feel that British politics has moved on since that disastrous Iraq war decision? Well, you know, it's, this book really tracks a... a, a a spiritual and a political journey of a person who wanted to have beliefs but not do anything about it right. and then was forced by, as many were, by the Iraq war to wake up. In 2003, when I went on that march, I was breastfeeding one baby, pushing another in a, in a pram. It was minus three degrees. If people were there, you they'll remember mm -hmm. snowing and sleeting and I told my three-year-old, it's not meant to be fun. Kids like you are dying, okay, which could sound <laughs> kind of harsh on a three-year-old walking yes. in the snow. Yes. But, you know, if you believe in something, you have to put yourself out there. Don't be an armchair anything. Yeah. And what I saw on that march was amazing. There were, there were women from Middle England who told me, I've never been on a march before, you know, dear, but this isn't right what's happening you know, shock and awe, is that what we're about now? My, grand, my, my father fought in the war and it wasn't about killing civilians, all right? So we had this idea of decency. Yeah. And what the Iraq war did was it wrecked our version of ourselves as British people. Right. This was before you became Muslim? This was before, ah. yeah. yeah. And I, I actually, um, I met Yusuf Chambers because of my activity there. Yeah. And um, we... He's the lawyer, Muslim the lawyer, lawyer, convert. Yes, sorry. Continue. Yeah, yeah. And um, he invited me to, to give a speech at uh, an event for Iraqi war widows and um, orphans. And I bring it up because that, that event was where the first time I'd really experienced segregation of the genders right. in my life. Yes. So I was speaking on the stage and then Yusuf said, and then I saw all the cool guys sitting over there and the sheikhs and uh, Cat Stevens, Yusuf um, Islam it's was nice. there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'll be sitting over there. And Yusuf went, no, no, the women are over here. And I went, mm. yeah. I'm really like a sulky child. Mm. And I, being a thinking person by the grace of Allah, I thought to myself, oh my God, I think I'm a misogynist because I don't like women. I don't want to say, and not apart from that, all the racist racism thoughts that I was having, like, oh God, I'm going to be talking about biryani and kids. Ugh, how I mean, these were all things yeah, sure. that that yeah. we can ignore or actually pick out in ourselves. But yes. and Islam is a very reflective, mashallah, um, uh, you know, uh, spiritual way of life. So, yes. so I picked up on those anyway. I, I went to the table, and there was the first niqabi I'd ever spoken to. Right. So she's sitting opposite the table and I thought, I'll just be nice and engage her, poor thing, mm. you know, mm. uh, a little bit about kitchen stuff. I said, so what do you do? And I fully expected to say, I've got seven kids mm. and I'm a third wife. And she said, oh, I'm studying civil, civil engineering <laughs> um, at the University of X, Y, and Z. I'm in my fourth year, you know, I got a first in this and da, 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 da. And I'm leading my class. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> and she wiped the floor with me. <laughs> Intellectually, she just, she, she got the mop. She put me in there and she wiped the floor with me. Right. And I loved it because I thought, good on you. And what she said to me coming right back and circling back to the beginning of our discussion, what does modesty mean to her? She said she used to be, when she first started university to fit in, she was in a t-shirt and jeans 
and um, she noticed the men looking at her. And when she got up, she might she she knew there was an uptick in the scoring mm. because, because people liked her presentation because she was pretty. Mm. And she said, then I started getting closer to my dean, and I wanted to to take away those triggers and protect myself for my lord, my family. And now I have to work not twice as hard, exponentially hard in my presentations because I have nothing here. Mm. But my words are good enough for me to be the head of that class. I'm like, boy, mm. I got it. <laughs> I think that's the moment I got modesty. And that's the moment I started to like women. Can I ask you about uh, your book, your biography, your memoir, In mm. Search of a Holy Land? I, I read uh, a really uh, fascinating section in the book about your uh, your experience. I mean, you were someone who was very much in favour of Tony Blair. Of course, he's a rel relative of yours. I mean, our viewers would know that he's married to your sister. And you were very much someone who was within the, the Labour mode and you supported New Labour as the alternative to... Uh, to you know, to conservatism, which was of course you know uh, horrid in in the 1990s. Oh, it's horrid now, and it's still horrid. Uh. That's true. That's very true. Uh, but then there was a change in in your view of labour and the Iraq War, of course, as you've just discussed. You know, comes into that. But uh, you know, I found it a fascinating read, and and um, in a way, it allowed me to understand how someone who was a non-Muslim viewed those years, because from a Muslim mm. perspective. You know, I saw it very much as a war on terror. This is a, a prime minister who's getting close to Bush. And, you know, it, it, it's it's amazing. Every day there was something on TV about Muslims. And every other day, Tony Blair was announcing an anti-terror law. And, you know, I just felt that Muslims were under siege during that period. So mm -hmm. it was fascinating to see from your perspective. But just from a broader sense, I mean, what lay behind? Why did you write this book, your memoir? I, I wrote this for somebody like myself in my 20s who got a sense that that this isn't it, this table, this mug, this world isn't it, the material world, that there's something more uh, out there but couldn't put my finger on it. And many of the, the, the people that we meet, they're exploring Buddhism and they're going through the tick boxes even veganism is almost like a religious cult now. You're cleansing your body to get closer to some amorphous being, right? But the minute, but what is the access point to a spirituality that leads to God? I wanted to, to give that access point. And also to run through the, the, the differences in the culture, the things that have been happening over the last 25 years. Who were we and who are we now? And there's so much in there as well about traveling to Muslim lands and to accepting my own innate prejudices as well. I hope I've done it in a humorous way. Yes, um, I think p people do tell me that, yes, I laughed my way through it and I cried my way through it. Mm -hmm. But that honesty about what I thought about Muslims, then you meet them and then you you suddenly find yourself in a mosque waking up going, oh my God, God is Allah. And this guy, Muhammad, I, I, th I kind of think he's the last prophet. What do you do with that? Mm. And so it takes us on that journey. And I really wanted to, to do that for people like me in my 20s. But I think more than ever, my readers are Muslims. Young Muslims asking themselves, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I, I don't know why I'm Muslim. Mm. I'm Muslim by heritage, but I don't know how to ask the questions. And I don't know how to come over this hump if I can make it in modernity as a Muslim. Mm. It answers those questions, inshallah, in, what, in, 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 one, in, in one way, from a Western perspective to an Eastern perspective, from a, from a Christian to a Muslim. Can I ask you one last question about Palestine? Now, you've been an advocate for Palestinian rights for a very long time. And um, you know, it's often quite perplexing to just see how Israel is treated in a very double you know, it's become now common to say that there is a hypocrisy, there's double standards, and Israel is, is treated in a completely different way than any other country in the world. It can get away with anything, really, and, and there will not be a uproar in the British press or in the American press or the European press. How do you understand this indefensible support for Israel in the West? I don't think think they're getting it all their own way anymore. 
Right. It's changing, isn't it? Since, uh, you know, just in the little time span when I've been an observer. And uh, uh, the other good thing, by the way, much better thing is that the Palestinians now have their own voice. Social media has allowed people like me to step back. You know, you don't need my voice now. Mm. Maybe you never did. Maybe it was white savior. Wallahu alam. I just, you know, we saw something and we wanted to reflect upon it with the world. Yeah. So there's a Palestinian voices now um, of pain, of brilliance, of cleverness, of resistance, and they're being heard. So that's number one. And the second thing is, I think the exceptionalism is falling apart. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, studies have shown that uh, young Christians in America, which is, which is really Israel's capital state mm. of support, uh, are now more likely to support the Palestinian cause than be Zionists. And, and that's huge. Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago in Australia, is it the government who said they're going to be referring to the occupants? They're not going to be calling it the occupied West Bank. They're going to be calling it Palestine now. That for the Zionists is like the stab in the heart. So yes, there is still political exceptionalism. And unfortunately, it looks going to take many more deaths and much more pain probably for that to change. But it is changing. Alhamdulillah. You know, never give up. Never give up. Allah sees all. They, they want to destroy Allah, so Allah, you know, Allah, Allah is with the believers and the world is waking up. So I, I actually feel much more positive than I did at the start of my personal experience with the quest, this question in 2005. Sister Lauren Booth, Jazakallah for your time today. It's been fascinating. Absolute pleasure.